<laughs> you know what time it is. Jaman. Jaman. Welcome to the Cali High Podcast. This is your host, Jen Zonico, and I've been a cannabis connoisseur for 50 years. On the Cali High Podcast, we will talk all things cannabis as they relate to California and beyond, from the history of buds in the state to the laws that now govern its use, to notable personalities in cannabis and how they shape the industry in California and the world, to growing personally and professionally, indoor and outdoors, from flowers to concentrates, edibles to topical cannabis creams, and the people behind the scenes. Reports from dispensaries, cultivators, medical patients, historical documents, and of course, recreational users. Hi folks, welcome to episode 10. This is Chenzo Nico, your host, and I'm here with Joe the Sound Guy, as always. Joe the Sound Guy. This week, we have a very special guest, Roger Steffens one of the world's foremost authorities on reggae music. He's a reggae archivist, and he used to have a show called The Reggae Beat on KCRW. Did they play reggae music? They played reggae music. Nice. Yeah. They had such a large following in Southern California. It was a great show. I always look forward to it. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's hear from Roger. Hi, Roger. How are you, buddy? I'm okay. Okay. I'm all right. I'm glad to be back inside. Excellent. I hope you're safe and well. Yeah, Um, we're trying hard. I know. It's a wild world we're living in these days. No kidding. So, I just have to tell you that you're being recorded. All right. Okay. The CIA sucks. I hate them. (laughs) They're a bunch of crooks. They've gotten a whole bunch of people addicted because they smuggle herb. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I I got carried away there. uh, And uh, and weren't they like pro Siaga anyway? Yeah. 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 Siaga. Okay, let's begin here. Um, Today, Cali High is honored to be speaking with Roger Steffens, the world's foremost authority on reggae. He is an actor. Well, that's, that, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I, I <laughs> don't know, know was, Roger, I swear. Well, I, th- I think I, I'm considered among uh, people who know a lot about reggae, but I hate, I hate the word expert. Okay. I'm certainly not world's uh, greatest. But, one of the most know, knowledgeable people on the subject. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's good. Uh, you're also an actor, an author, a lecturer, editor, photographer, reggae archivist director and producer. Also, I just found out that you were a photographer in Vietnam. Uh, That wasn't by assignment, but I took over 10,000 frames. Wow. That's interesting how that came about. Uh I mean, I had nothing before that but a little brownie that I traveled the country with when I was reading poetry in schools before I got drafted. Well, that's amazing. uh, Well, thank you, Roger, uh, for agreeing to speak with Cali High today, and we are blessed. How are you? (laughs) <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be alive on a day like this. With, yes, you know, indeed. We're all blessed to be alive. Dying. God. But it, it's so unnerving. I mean, I, I was in Saigon for the Tet Offensive in 1968, and I think I'm more frightened now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's totally out of control. There's no bunker to go down deep in if you want to live any kind of normal life. Yeah, it's it's kind of something that we've not experienced in our lifetimes. And I was just thinking today, you know, this is the perfect month to be cooped up as long as you have your stash with you because it's for a whole month, it's 420. That's right, bro. And... uh, (laughs) Listen, we just took a hit while we were waiting for you, and oh, good. Uh, it is a beautiful day. Yeah, bud. Yeah. What are you smoking? Um, I, I rolled a combo of some wedding cake and some do si OG, mm. both from uh, LA Cannabis. They've got nice. some pretty good stuff down there. Yeah. So, the engineer approved. what are you smoking? <laughs> well, um, we have some Echo Park shit face. Oh, that and, sounds great. Uh, I would say it was very locally grown. Nudge, nudge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, just 
just the right amount of, of groove uh -huh. to get you through an afternoon, you know, and watch some Netflix at night. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a, I like the name too. And, oh, and I wanted to say I'm I'm here as always with Joe the Sound Guy. Hi, Joe the Sound Guy. Yeah, how you doing? Thanks for uh, coming in uh, on the phone. Oh man, what a beautiful voice you have. Well, I don't know. You remember Soy Cowboy, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Joe was oh, the lead why? singer. Soy? Yep. Okay, that's why. Of yeah, course. he's got a yeah, great voice. Hi, Joe. <laughs> I always accuse him of putting more bass on his voice because he sounds better than me. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know. A voice like that don't need no bass. Uh, we, we just got off the, the phone with Tom Schnabel. Oh, nice. Yeah, and he gives his... What's he doing greens. on a dope show? Well, talking about other people smoking dope. <laughs> oh. Yeah, because I don't think I've ever smoked with him, and I've known him, what, for almost 40 years now. Really? Oh, wait a minute. 21 here. years. Okay, well, fact, when we get off the phone... I was first hire at KCRW. Yeah. Well, um, he's still working for KCRW, so we don't want to go into that too deeply you right now. No, we now. want to protect him. Yeah. <laughs> Even though he doesn't smoke. <laughs> no, he... Yeah, of course not. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> no, he hasn't smoked for a good 30 years. Uh, anyway, speaking of uh, reggae and KCRW, can we talk about where and when you first heard reggae music? Yeah, it was 1973, um, June. An issue of Rolling Stone had just come out on newsprint in those days and folded in half, and the inside cover was this totally wasted-looking guy with dreadlocks, and they <laughs> called him Country Man, C-U-N-C-H-Y-M-A-N. Uh -huh. It was Country Man that yeah, they yeah. made the movie of about, about uh, years and years later. Uh, it was an article called The Wild Side of Paradise by a gonzo journalist from Australia named Michael Thomas, who said, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of upper Niger consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh man, I don't know what the hell that is, but I got to find it right now. And I was living in Berkeley and I went down to Shattuck Avenue and I found a used copy of Catch a Fire in the Zippo light cover uh, for two and a quarter. And I figured I could take a chance. And I took it home and my mind was completely blown. And the next night in a little theater on north side of Berkeley's campus, I saw The Harder They Come in a little 40-seat theater. Uh, and when the chalice scene came on, everybody in the theater lit up and you couldn't even see <laughs> the screen anymore for all the smoke in the room. <laughs> and on the way home, I bought the soundtrack to The Harder They Come. Oh, and great my life album. changed forever from, from that moment. Uh, I've been on a reggae trod. That's 47 years of my life now. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah, it's been uh, two years shorter than that for me, but when I first heard Naughty Dread, I was just completely blown away. Um, yeah. So, how did you meet Tom Schnabel, by the way? I had a friend in the neighborhood in Silver Lake where I was living uh, named Harry Zeitlein, who had a late-night jazz show on KCRW. He's a rabbi in Jerusalem now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, in 1978... That's what I, reggae I, will I, do for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 uh, in 78, uh, I was at the Barton's record store on the corner of La Brea by Hollywood, right at the beginning of you know the, the strip in Hollywood. And uh, uh, I met a guy in there who was uh, the drummer in the group called The Untouchables, a guy named Josh Harris. Oh, yeah. And we got to talking about reggae, and uh, I said I'd been to Jamaica, and he says, oh, you got to meet this fellow I met here in Barton's Records last week. Uh, he's a real freak. He's got an incredible collection. His name is Hank Holmes. So he gave me his number, and I called him when I got home, and Hank had never met anybody who'd been to Jamaica, let alone gone there to buy records. And he asked <laughs> me about a couple of tracks, and I said, oh, I got that. And <laughs> I got that. He says, can you come over here right now? And I went over to his house and talk about mind-blowing. He had about 8,000 Jamaican records. Oh, my God. And he had never left Los Angeles. And what year life. was that? This was 1978. That's and phenomenal. He, 
he would sell them out of his house on Friday nights. He had a little uh, mail order record company called Reggae Beat. So he uh, he invited us over the next Friday night, and he was such a freak, man. He was a recluse. He he worked in a one stop, which is a hotel, a wholesale retail record supplier. Mm -hmm. uh, down on Pico, and he worked in a little glass booth <laughs> like Eichmann in the <laughs> back of the record store. And uh, he would watch for people to go over to a little section of reggae that the wholesaler had, and then he would walk up to him and say, uh, you like reggae? And they'd say, oh, yeah, I love reggae, but I can't find it. He'd hand him his business card with the reggae beat on it and say, uh, you can come over to my house on any Friday night and see, if, <laughs> see if you can find something. But this was the thing. When when I met him, we went into his back room. It was right across the street from CBS Television City in Hollywood, Fairfax. Uh -huh. He had crates, like big crates of lettuce, yeah. filled with 45s. And the way he, I mean, he got all of this 8,000 record mass for almost nothing. He worked in a one-stop, which dealt with cutouts, with records that they'd press too many of them and they would sell them off for like 25 cents an album. And in England, there's something they call Northern Soul. And that's basically American soul music, but it's collected by people up in Manchester and Birmingham and places like that. And they love it. And they pay 10 pounds an, al an album up there for these things. Mm -hmm. So Hank looks in the back of New Musical Express and other music magazines from England, and he sees these little classified ads, 10 reggae singles for one pound. So he calls these record dealers in, in England, and he says, well, if I give you such and such a soul album that's worth 10 pounds, would you give me 10 pounds worth of reggae singles? In other words, 100 <laughs> singles. And they said yes. And he began this this deal where he he'd be getting boxes of and boxes of records that you could barely lift for like three dollars. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> that is totally amazing. I remember so, Hank. He was your partner on the reggae beat. He was my yeah. partner, and he would tell these incredible stories on Friday nights. He'd had everybody around the table just on the floor. Oh yeah. But when he got on the air. He wouldn't tell any of the stories, and it drove me nuts because <laughs> he, he was, and, and he would lift the needle up in the middle of a record so that nobody got a perfect copy of it but him. And he just had these, these funky little, you know. He was worried about people recording there? Um, yeah, yeah, that they would have a perfect copy, and mm -hmm. he wouldn't have the only perfect copy anymore. That's amazing. So we tried to get back to your original question, uh -huh. Long Winded Roger says. Um, to, we tried for a year to get on the air. I said, man, with your collection and your knowledge and my radio background, which goes back to 1961 in New York, my first guest was Baba Tunde Olatunji, the drums of Passion Master. Oh, yeah. And uh, I figured we could do a great radio show. And we tried for a year. We went to all the commercial stations. They laughed at us. I did a guest spot on Dr. Demento's show and played uh, uh, Ram Goat Liver. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> And uh, we uh, started going to uh, non-commercial stations, and we figured the perfect fit for us, really, would have been KPFK, Radical Left Wing Station. Oh, yeah. So well, we yeah. went there, and we, we guested on three other people's shows, and we got really nice response. And then we got a call from the white woman who was running the station at the time to come down. And we walked in thinking we, after a year we were finally going to get on the air. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, you know, you, you sound very professional and uh, you had good music and we got nice response, but this is KPFK. We can't in good conscience put you white people on the air playing black Jamaican music. Really? So uh, to, to the original question, meeting Tom and have the KCRW thing come about, this was after a year of desperation and false hopes. This is October now of uh, 1979. Mm -hmm. Harry introduces me to Tom Schnabel. We give him copies of the KPFK shows. He says, this is perfect for Sunday 
uh, put you on beginning next Sunday, October 7th, and that was the beginning of the reggae beat. And within months, we were the number one most popular non-commercial radio show in Los Angeles. Oh, and yeah. That went on for years. Tom yeah. was just raving about you and your uh, revenue-raising abilities. <laughs> yeah, we made a lot of money. A lot of money. And KPFK oh, could have eat had their hearts money. out. Eat your freaking hearts out, yeah. you guys. White people can't play black music. That sounds totally out of character for KPFK. I just don't well, know. they went through about 47 general managers since then. Uh huh. Well, speaking of general managers, how was working with Ruth Hirschman? Ultimately, awful. <laughs> I'm not going to call her a racist, but she freaked out whenever there were black people there, and we were one of the only shows that brought black people to the station. Uh huh. Well, yeah, she she fired me for uh, interviewing a, a black woman, and she said it was another one of my uh, my nobodies, and I was wasting her precious airtime. It was Alfre Woodard. Well, uh, yikes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Ruth. So, well. Yeah, she fired me on my tenth anniversary. Uh, well, she's gone now, but yeah. So back to good times. Uh, so yeah. seventy nine, I believe, was your first interview with the reggae for the reggae beat, and that was well, Bob interview, Marley. First actual interview was, I think, on show number three. That would have been the twenty first of October, and that was Jeff Walker, who had been Bob Marley's publicist at Island Records in the, the mid sixties, and was in Jamaica when he was shot and filmed uh, the Smile Jamaica concert, in fact. Yeah. And um, fascinating interview. But our first musical guest was um, the show number seven. That was uh, last week of uh, November. Uh, we were on the air for about seven weeks when Island Records called us and said, would you mind going on the road for two weeks with Bob Marley? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> and so we, we got to be with him on and off in all different places, uh, riding on the bus with him to San Diego and going to sound checks at the Roxy and hanging out at the hotel. And I set up two evenings on a Monday and Tuesday when he was off. Monday night, we showed him a movie that was being cut in Jamaica at that time. Uh, called Heartland Reggae, which was the uh, One Love Peace concert film, mm -hmm. which also featured Dennis Brown and uh, Judy Mowat and Jacob Miller and Peter Tosh, and uh, he had never seen it. And then the next night, Jeff Walker brought his footage uh, from Smile Jamaica and a documentary he had made a 20-minute demo film of to give to his boss, Chris Blackwell, uh, with the intention of making a full-length feature of this historic night when Bob performed in front of all those people with the bullet in his arm from two nights later before. So um, you got two films that he's never seen, So I and I'd seen them several times because I knew the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So we sat in the bungalow at the, Chateau, at the uh, um, Sunset Marquee Hotel. They have these big chateau that they call bungalows. Uh -huh. And Bob and his whole group rented one of them. So there were about... 45, 50 people in the living room. And um, I got to watch Bob. Watch Bob. And in oh, the um, One Love Peace concert film, there's that immortal moment where he brings Edward Siaga, the, the right wing. Uh, yeah. You know, with Michael CIA Manley. Cat, and makes him shake hands with Manley, exactly. And after we watched that, I, uh, he was asked, what was going through your mind standing between these two guys and who's named thousands of people have been murdered. And Bob says, well, I'm a no politician, but if I'm on a politician, only one thing for me to do, kill them both. Yeah, those were trying times for Jamaica. What an honest response, too. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, <laughs> so, that was kind of surprising. But um, he, he was an amazing guy. And I got, you know, I, the, the final minutes I had with him were at a three-hour sound check at the Roxy. He was doing a benefit for Sugar Ray Robinson's foundation. And uh, the first hour, he kept singing he, he kept singing something over and over and over again that I'd never heard before about redemption. And he went on to do a three-hour sound check where he played all the instruments himself. The family man, his band leader, the bass player was mm -hmm. up in the booth. Barrett. Setting the 
instruments. Yeah. Awesome, Barrett. Yeah, that was the last time I saw Bob. And what year was that? That was November. I think it was the twenty ninth, twenty eighth, twenty eighth of November, nineteen seventy nine. Mm-hmm. And he died in 81? He died in 81. When he was 24 in Delaware visiting his mother in Wilmington, he met a couple of young fellows, Dion Wilson and uh, his friend, and he told them he was going to die at 36. He was 24 years old at the time. How so precious. Yeah. Wow. Well, those early days were amazing, and uh, I... I I must thank you for all of our listeners and all of the reggae audience for archiving things and bringing them to us. Well, it's a history that deserves preserving, you know? Yeah. Uh, Jama- anything older than five years in Jamaica is not worth thinking about anymore. So they don't have any sense of their own history. It's really a damn shame. But I'm on the road to to helping him change that. You yeah. know, I've been trying for a long, long time to get my archives, which fills seven rooms of the house here in Echo Park. Aren't you leaving part of your... Uh, are, are you leaving part of your collection to a regular so museum? What's going to happen, it looks like, uh, although the, pand- the pandemic has thrown a, a monkey wrench into a lot of things, uh, I'm in final stages of negotiations for my entire archive to go to Jamaica to become a museum in Montego Bay. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, uh, nothing I can talk about beyond that publicly, but mm-hmm. it looks, after 30 years of trying and turning down <laughs> an awful lot of money, because it's not about the money, I want it to go to Jamaica, and I want it to be available to everybody who comes to see it and use it while respecting all the artist rights. And, pres- and and they have to promise to keep it forever. Well, so respect to you, bro. I finally found someone after all these years who, who will agree to that. Mm-hmm. So, That's excellent. Prayer. Why Montego Bay prayer. and not, not Kingston? Because it's much safer. Yeah. I mean, Kingston is still a very, very dangerous place, and it's not really a tourist place. No. Know, no beaches. And mm-hmm. The slums are everywhere. There's a, who wants to look at poverty all the time? I hear you. So the North Coast is almost completely bought up by capitalists and the locals can't go to their own beaches anymore. Anthony Bourdain episode on Jamaica is banned in Jamaica. No, oh, I saw that where yeah. he, he talks to Chris Blackwell, does he, I believe? Is oh, it? yeah. Yeah, and the giant estate of Chris's on the beach or the cliffs above the beach. Not Chris's, that belongs to a billionaire Jamaican-Canadian investor. Mm-hmm. Uh, named Michael Lee Chin, Interesting. who at one time was going to buy my archive back in 2004, but uh, he couldn't find a receiving body in Jamaica who would be responsible enough to accept it. Mm-hmm. That didn't work. Well, going back to the Smile Jamaica concert, uh, recently Callie High interviewed Richard Daly of Third World. And it, oh, nice. And it was really cool. And in your book, Too Much Things to Say, you speak with Stephen Catcore of Third World quite a bit, and his quotes are yeah. numerous. When did you first meet Cat? Oh, that's a good question. It was right after Bob died. It was October of, of 81. There were two nights of Marley tributes at the country club in Reseda. Oh, I remember and that. And it was an all-star show. It was Joe Higgs, Freddie McGregor, Judy Mowat, Marcia Griffiths, and and Third World. Yeah. Uh, and the Whalers Band. Mm-hmm. And he was part of it that night. Yeah. So we, we go back uh, that far. And uh, I just admire him so much. He's, he's a, a really nice, cultured, um, true spirit. Yeah, he's a know? great guy. And I love and so his most famous quote, of course, is in my book, where he says, everywhere he goes in the world today, he's always measured on a scale of one to Bob Marley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> As is reggae, every reggae artist. Yeah. Well, you know, they have a great new album uh, produced by Bob's son, Damien. Yeah, I have it. It's really nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. So... Let's talk a little bit about your experiences with Peter Tosh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Peter scared a lot of people. 
Mm-hmm. And Dennis Hunt, who was a black music critic for the Times back in the early 80s, and basically said he was a madman in a review he made. Well, he had strong here. opinions, that's for sure. He sure did, and he wore those starkers, those those dark sunglasses with mm-hmm. the side pieces yeah. all the time. So a little bit intimidating. Think, yeah, but I think it was because he didn't want people to see the twinkle in his eye because he played with people a lot, uh-huh. you know, and he had this fierce demeanor about him. But he was, privately, he was one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. I just, you know, when I worked on the um, honorary citizen box set of Peter's Life, wrote the essays in there and uh, uh, had a whole page in the booklet called Words of the Herbalist Verbalist. He called his manager his damager. He (laughs) called his producer his reducer. He called, they talked about the judge and the crime minister who shit in the house of represent the thief. (laughs) 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 And he called the queen of England queen ear lies a bitch. Uh (laughs) And And a satica? Yeah, it wasn't America. No. There's nothing merry about America. It's a Satica. And San Francisco, California, United States of a Satica. Follywood. Yeah. <laughs> what California. A guy. Tell me about, you, Tom says you were with him when Peter Tosh came to the studio. Oh, that was a riot. Um, you know, Ruth was really uptight. <laughs> black people. And in those days, KCRW, which just recently moved into a $38 million studio. Oh, yeah. In those days, it was in the... Where my sustaining uh, dollars are going. Yeah. In those days, it was in the the far right corner, closest to Pearl Street. Um, No, Pico, Pico side of Pearl. Mm -hmm. In a junior high school classroom. Which was in session. Yeah, I mean, uh, you'd hear the bells ring every forty-five minutes uh-huh. on the air. On the air, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Tosh shows up about eleven thirty with a half hour left of Morning Goes Macosa, or Morning Becomes Eclectic, which he was guesting on uh-huh. some show. And he walks in with a, a cricket bat spliff, <laughs> uh, just enormous, billowing, smoky spliff, and. Who's going to tell Peter Tosh to put out a spliff? spliff? Nobody, right? So yeah. he sits down and we talk to him for half an hour and he tells these incredible stories and being held down by some duppies. And the only thing that could let him break through the curse of the duppies immobilizing him was to yell, Mama Clot! and release the spell of evil. And since that day, we never stopped say Bumba Clot. And, you know, by now it's like, the theater with the harder they come. <laughs> All yeah, yeah. Ago. <laughs> the studio is just white with smoke, and we figure there's a little office on the other side of the, the broadcast room that's yeah. where Ruth sits, and she has to walk through the studio to go to her little interview chamber where she reads the New York Times at noon every day. Oh, jolly not so good. <laughs> so about two minutes to 12, Peter is in one of his rants, and she walks through, and she just walks straight into the interview room and shuts the door. And Tom and I look at each other. Uh, we're cooked. <laughs> we'll, we'll never say another word on KCRW again. <laughs> it's, it's over. And we finish the interview and we throw it over to Ruth. And Ruth, Ruth gets on the air. And the first thing she says is, you know, whenever there's a big star in the station, there's always a different kind of atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> that was and kind of funny for said. her. That's all she said. <laughs> she never said another word to Tom. As far as I remember, is that his memory? Um, he had so, something about her, like taking one look at, at Peter and just kind of not wanting to voice her objection and kept going into her office. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Ruth was tall, but Peter was about six four. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so the other Tosh story yep. that I want to share with you, please do. Uh, Bob had a, a fantastic Irishman from Liverpool as his main publicist, a man named Charlie Comer, uh-huh. and he was 
just a delight, a reformed alcoholic. He worked for Brian Epstein before Epstein found the Beatles and was with the Beatles in the helicopter going into Shea Stadium. Oh, wow. In the 60s, he worked for Lennon, he worked for Jagger, and he was Bob's main publicist in the 70s. Uh, and also for Peter Tosh, and he really, really loved Peter. So back in 79, it was the month before the reggae beat started, Charlie called me from his office in New York, and he says, Roger, Peter's in your town, but he's got no herb. Can you help him out? <laughs> and I said, well, Charlie, as a matter of fact, I've just come back from a plantation in Santa Cruz where they had a whole bunch of 16-foot plants, and I was given two of the colas, the tops of the plants. Oh, yeah. And he says, well, Peter's in... The, the Sunset Marquis gave me the room number, and he said, he'll be expecting you now. So Mary, my wife, puts this beautiful wrapping paper around uh, a 22, 23-inch long cola, which is as <laughs> round as a grapefruit. Oh, my God. This, I mean, this is the best centerfold you ever saw in high times. Oh, yeah. And she puts a red, gold, and green ribbon around the package. And off we go to the Sunset Marquee, knock on Peter's door. And Peter's got a chain on the door, and he opens it just as far as the chain goes. And he looks out in the crack. And I'm standing there like I'm holding a big fish in my hand, you know, horizontally. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's his beautiful wrapping paper. And he says, oh, what not? And I said, Peter, it's a gift to you from all the herbalists of California. And he lets go of the chain, opens the door, grabs me, pulls me in, grabs me, pulls her in, slams the door, puts the chain back on, all in about five seconds. <laughs> and he, he rips a little piece of the paper off, and he sees what's in it. So he takes the ribbon off, he takes all the paper off, then he looks at the thing, he looks down the barrel of it, he breaks a piece off, and he smells it. Then he turns to me and he says, Chaw take a whole lot more than this to get my propeller spin. <laughs> That's funny. And you know what? I, I and have... he didn't give it back. <laughs> do, you, do you remember Elmer from the Roxy and the Whiskey? Oh, my God. Who doesn't? Yeah. So he called it. Peter Tosh was playing the Roxy, I think. And he called up one of my friends who shall remain nameless at this point. And Elmer told him, look, Peter Tosh needs some herb. And you got to come down here right away. <laughs> Similar story, but uh, he, he went down there with about a half pound and just oh, enough. two days worth. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, <laughs> Peter didn't bat an eye and, you know, whatever. Not an eye, yeah. no. Hey, <laughs> speaking of old herb, what were some of your very favorite herbs from the old times? Well, you know, I, I dropped acid about a year and a half before I ever smoked herb. Wow. And I, I, I never smoked anything, so mm -hmm. I, I wasn't really attracted to it. Uh -huh. um, and after you've had an atom bomb, what's a firecracker? Yeah, but yeah. then I get drafted and sent to Numb. They got there just before the Tet Offensive, and you were there was no front line in Vietnam, and that's a kind of tension that I don't ever want to experience again. Yeah, not and in knowing... those days, pre-Tet, they were th throwing grenades off motorcycles into sidewalk cafes filled with GIs, and they were you know, blowing up buildings where the officers lived. Mm -hmm. it, you were always looking over your shoulder. So I needed something to cut the tension. And I I didn't want to, I don't like drinking. I, I, I didn't want to be drunk because if you're drunk, you stay fucking drunk. Yeah. Can I say that? Yeah, you can say that. Uh, okay. This is a, um, a podcast where we can say fucking drunk. All right, okay. So... Uh, <laughs> I was looking for something to cut the tension, and all these guys are, not all these guys, but the guys I was friendly with, my kind of guys, you know, hippies who got drafted. <laughs> they were exactly. all smoking something. They were all smoking something called Park Lanes. Mm -hmm. And I have, a, I have an empty pack of Park Lane about three feet from where I'm sitting, and I'm looking at it right now, complete with a Vietnamese tax stamp on it, and it was marijuana with filter tips. In oh my park god. Lane packages. Vietnamese and you weed? It, weed. Wow. And you could get it on any street corner for twenty five cents US a pack. Or uh, save some money by a carton of two hundred for two dollars. In other words, a penny a joint. And it was commie weed and it was so, so good. And that's where I started smoking. It mm -hmm. took me about two weeks where I didn't run to the bathroom and throw up. Uh huh. They used to take vets in the in the barracks about 
how, how many puffs I could take before I went into the bath. <laughs> <laughs> but I finally learned how to keep it down, and it's the one of the best skills I've, I've ever had. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was... I've basically been stoned for 53 years with a 14-month dare-induced uh, break. Yeah. Well, I had I broke a small break where I, had to, I joined the Navy, and I only smoked, like, one hit every, like, two weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, but, were you on a ship? No, I was at Point Magoo. And, oh, uh, locally? Yeah, and yeah, while I was stationed there, um, I recorded uh, a version of Old Cow Hand with Soy Cowboy, and we gave the cassette to Tom, the little picture of the band, a little note, and he called me up and said he was going to play it. <laughs> so you, you knew each other that far back? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great to have a friend that long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's great to have old friends. Yeah, um, you know, d Tom and I actually went to Thailand together. Really? Yep. What year was that? That was 1998 or 99. Were there still tie sticks available? No. I mean, the last really great tie stick I ever smoked was in, in the Grace Hotel in Bangkok in 1982. And wow, I got, that long. Yeah. Uh, but remember, it was like grayish green. There were like l little buds on the sticks, and they were so spicy and flavorful. They they just went perfectly with Thai food and oh, Thai God beer. Mm. You're giving me a Woody. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my my old friend uh, Frank Mariano, who was a former uh, helicopter pilot in the army, and quit because he hated what the army was doing, and became. Uh, correspondent for ABC television, and then eventually the uh, the bureau chief in Saigon used to come back for leave and would stay with me in my apartment in Berkeley in the early 70s. And every time he came back with his little adopted uh, Vietnamese daughter, he would stuff her diapers with uh, tie sticks. <laughs> How clever. <laughs> yeah, nobody yeah. ever looked in the diapers. <laughs> hey, um, I wanted to ask you, do you have any new favorite reggae artists? It's kind of a hard one because I don't really stay too current with, with the music. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more a golden age guy. I hear you. 6 to 81. But uh, I, I've seen, I went down for the opening of the Peter Tosh Museum a couple of years ago and I, I saw Kabaka Pyramid perform and I, I thought he was really good. Oh, yeah. Chronics I've seen them. some good stuff. Chronics um, is great. Uh, Jesse Royal, I like. Mm -hmm. What about Protégé? Pro, yes, Protégé for sure. He's Lorna Bennett's son. Oh my Lorna God, Bennett because I made a comment. I made a comment on his Instagram page and Lorna Bennett liked my comment. I'm like, Sh is she his mother? Oh, yes, she is. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, how cool. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, you. so you remember uh, Breakfast in Bed. That was a, an amazing sure. song. Sure. I, I saw her sing it live at Sunsplash 83. Oh, wow. She was a, a, a stewardess on Air Jamaica. Hmm. Let me ask you, do you have a favorite Bob Marley album? Album? Yeah. I don't know. You know, for a lot of people, uh, their favorite Marley album is usually the first one they heard. Mm-hmm. So for a lot of younger people, it's legend, of course. Yeah. Um, it, it might be uh, Catch a Fire for me because that was the first one. I love Natty Dread. I, I think Survival is his most important album. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the final mature statement of his philosophy. It wasn't the Natty Dread eye for an eye. I feel like bombing a church now that yeah. the preacher is lying. It was the one love philosophy. You know. Yeah. Um, it's a it's very important record. Um, Let me ask you, do you have a favorite Peter Tosh song? Yeah, Fool's Die. Mm-hmm the whalers recorded as wisdom wow yeah i'm not familiar and, uh, i'm gonna have to go home and listen to that oh that's a beautiful track how yeah. about off of his solo albums bob's solo Peter, album? peter's well all peter's albums were solo yeah, yeah the, the two fools, fools die forget which one it's on oh, that, oh i think that might be on legalize it uh, maybe no, not. i think no. that's too early it's a, it all blurs after a while. When you're 77 years of age, you have so many memories that your hard drive gets full. 
Yeah, I'm sure it does. And um, let me ask you one last question here. Uh, there's so much that I could talk to you about, Roger, and, and maybe we could do a follow-up interview. But let me ask yeah, on. one last question here. Bob got signed with Chris Blackwell for Island Records, and then before that, he was working with Danny Sims, or he yep. was... How did that transpire from Danny Sims' label to Blackwell's? Well, he was putting out a lot of Bob's songs and getting absolutely nowhere with them. The arrangements didn't work on American radio, and no matter what he tried, he couldn't get anything out of Bob on the radio. But uh, Johnny Nash had success with several of Bob's songs. And he was produced by Um, uh, uh, Sims? Danny's partner, yeah. Johnny, Danny, and uh, Arthur Jenkins were Jad, Johnny, mm-hmm. Arthur, and Danny. And uh, Danny had signed Peter and Bob to his label in '68 when they, when he and Johnny were living in Jamaica. And uh, I think ultimately Johnny recorded well over two dozen of Bob's songs, mm-hmm. but they couldn't get hits. So uh, Danny uh, brought Bob to uh, London in '72. And they made a record. Uh, he, he subcontracted him to CBS Records, Columbia Records in England. And Bob made reggae on Broadway, which was a huge mistake. Uh-huh. Broadway has no, there's no conception of Broadway in England. It's me, you know, it's High Street. If he had made reggae on High Street, it might have been a hit. Mm-hmm. But it went nowhere. And he got an offer from Chris Blackwell. So he had to figure out a way to buy Bob out of his CBS contract and uh, got a two-point override on everything Bob would write oh my through, God. 1970, through 1976. He, uh, he, he still Bob collects on that again. or his estate? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, when I, I, when I was working on this 11-disc series uh, called The Complete Whalers, 1967-72, which is all the stuff owned by Danny, um, I, I was looking for something, I can't remember exactly what, but I asked Danny if he could get it for me, and he says, I could get you anything, I'm a mobster. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he did that long interview with me just before he died, which, fine, you know, luckily I had time to get it into the book. Where Yeah, uh, he's quoted quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you know he admitted that his partner in business is Joe Armoni of the uh, Gambino family, mm-hmm. well, and all that San Juan music stuff—that's all mafia stuff. That, that's the Lee Perry stuff and the uh, Leslie Kong, Kong stuff. Yeah, we, we, Joe and I are both Italian American, but we have nothing against the mafia. And, and but you we, better not. Yeah. <laughs> My backyard was the end of Emerson, New Jersey, and there was never any crime in Emerson, New Jersey. And oddly enough, it was Italian-Americans who were the mayor and city council in that town. Yep. Yeah. Well, Roger, I want to recommend to our listeners that they read your latest book, So Much Things to Say, The Oral History of Bob Marley. It's a great book. I've read it. It's, it certainly enlightened me to things I wasn't aware of. And so I I thank you for that. Great book. And thank you for talking to Callie High today. We are blessed. Keep doing what you guys are doing, you and Joe. And uh, I hope we can continue the conversation. We will. And by God, there's a lot of bad things about 2020. I never believed that we would look back (laughs) at 2019 with fondness. (laughs) When it's over, bro, we're going to roll a big one and share it. Absolutely. And get both of you guys over here to the archives. So thank you for talking to me, and uh, thank God we live in a state where herb is legal. Yes, thank God. One love, my brother. One love, Roger. Thank you. Have a great day. We'll talk. Okay, more time. All right. Man, you find the coolest people to interview. I'm so lucky, and we are lucky, bro. Yeah, dude. Cali High is lucky. And I want to thank Roger Steffens for being our guest on episode 9. Oh, what was that? What the fuck? What? Episode 10. Was That it? was the end of the season, bro. Went by so fast. Oh, my God. Well, thank you for listening, folks. And stay tuned for season 2 and this upcoming little reflection on our times. We have a reflection coming? Yeah. You were playing bongos. Oh, that, that one. Yeah. 
And the seeds in a jar. Is and, it and the seeds, yeah. And you used my Afghan seeds in a jar as some percussion. Seeds in a jar. Seeds in a jar. Down in the backyard. Quarantine is hard. Domestic captain. Prisoner emoji. How about a bone rip? Open beer and sit. Baby shoot hoops. Can't ride in the coop. I'm my own winner, waiting for dinner. Who will ever know or come to this show? Starting a garden, planting a seed then. Who knows? We will see. In my backyard, it's custody. When the weather's bad, we groove in the pad. Develop hobbies, only three bodies. I'm gonna sneak out. Around the block and shout. Washing my own hands. After the postman. Drops in the mailbox, envelope, card box, roll up a big split, the backyard boutique. Go swim in the pool with basketball rules. The whims of a kid come in the pool, dad, listen to reggae. It's a nice day, a silver lining, a lost divining. But what's coming next? TV? Oh, it's Trump. Doctor, surgeon, stumped. Briefing. Paradox. Truth not in a box. Oh well, I'll turn it off. Rimsky Korsakov? <laughs>